Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. I felt kind of bad, bass players were the butt end of my shorts joke today. You can check out that video right up here, it's only 16 seconds, then come back here. So to make it up to the thumpers, I thought I would review this awesomely sweet jazz bass. This has to be one of the most decked out jazz basses I have ever seen. And it is a Japan exclusive for a guy named Gino. Well, his name's actually Kenji Hino, but you just kind of blend his names for Gino. And I'll be honest, I knew nothing about this guy, but the demo he did of his new signature bass for Fender, he was just so ecstatic the entire time. He had a great energy about him, and I was like, yes, I want to support that guy because he just put a smile on my face at how excited he was to have a signature jazz bass. But he does have his own record label. He's a music director on top of just being a bass player. I couldn't really find tons of information out there about this guy. Except for that he was born in Japan but when he was seven years old he and his family moved to New York City and that's where he just kind of grew up until about 2003 when he went back to Japan just to be the base home of operations for everything. But Gino, uh, definitely check him out because he's kind of a, a quirky character and I appreciate him. But his signature bass has a bunch of stuff to go over. Now, I'm not much of a bass player, so I'm not gonna be the best guy to demo it. Just check out Mr. Hino over on the Fender Bass channel. Fender Gino Jazz Bass. Yes. But I'm sure some people have been wanting to see a real close-up look at this thing because it's, it's a little bit bizarre. Apparently, Japan really likes Surf Green because this is the second exclusive guitar from Japan that's Surf Green. Last time we had the Silent Sirens, except for we had that little design right here. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is a really beefed up jazz bass. It's an HSH setup. So we've got a humbucker in the middle of all these pickups. You've got four controls. One of them's a split dual level thing. This is an active and a passive bass. It's going to take a while to go over all this stuff, but check this out. We even have what I love on bass guitars, block inlays. I'm always a sucker for aesthetics. So when I bought my first bass, I bought one of those green Dean ones simply because it was the cheapest bass I could find that had the block inlays. But the neck profile on this, I, I love it. I've never had a bass feel so comfortable. It's like a, a baseball bat from like Gibson territory. I mean, this feels like a guitar neck, except for it's more rounded because the nut width isn't as large. But then you go up here, it doesn't have that whole wide flat thing going on. I have never felt a bass like this. And this is one of those really, really nice feeling satin finishes. It's not one of those cheaper ones. It feels like almost a semi-gloss. So even if a made in Japan guitar is not necessarily your style, which I don't know why it wouldn't be, every Fender Japan that I've had has actually been really good. I think if you're a serious bass player, this could be a lot of fun for you. I mean, I love the matching colored headstock and the big, bold logos. But you're probably curious how much these things are. In Japan, they're 178,200 yen, which is roughly about 1800 USD, but that includes their tax. So in order to import one yourself, after all import duties, shipping, and all that other stuff, it should be roughly $2,000. So today we're gonna find out, is it actually worth it to do that or not? And if you are interested in owning this one after I'm done making my video, you can check it out on my website, troglisguitarshow.com. You won't have to import one, you can just have mine. Okay, troglodytes, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside the 70s inspired Geno bass, we got a lot to go over. So first off, our pick guard is three ply mint green. So we've got that black layer in between right there. It looks pretty nice on this. I mean, technically you don't even have to have it on if you don't mind all these screw holes. But now what you're really here for, the pickups. The neck and the bridge pickup are the same model. The Fender Japan website calls them premium vintage style 70s single coil jazz pickups. That's a long name, but they've got a black cover over top of them 
And this is what they look like when you take them out. I cannot see like any barcodes or anything on them because you've got these foam blocks in order to set the height adjustment. But inside here, it's all shielded off. You get the grounding tab. And all of that is the same for the bridge pickup cavity as well. But now for the middle pickup, it's called the Modern Modified Humbucker. Oh, nothing too fancy to look at for us. So now leading from here, we get to our controls. Now this looks really complicated and there's a whole mess of wires in here. So I don't want to fully pull it out. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get it back in, <laughs> but I'll do it for you guys anyways. So inside here, we have the Fender FMEQ preamp. It does utilize a battery. And inside here, the cavities are looking the same as what we saw in the pickups. But you're gonna see two of these are push pull pots and then we get a stacked pot right here. So this guy right here is your neck pickup. And since we don't have any type of selector switch anywhere, you just blend these pickups however you like it by selecting the volume. But this also doubles as the choice between an active or a passive bass. You get both of them. But when you have it as active, I'm not sure which one it is. I haven't plugged it in yet. You can control that using this. One of these acts as your bass boost. The other one is for your treble frequencies. So you can just dial that in however you want it. And if you don't like active electronics, don't worry, just run it passive. Moving on to our second knob, this is actually our bridge control. So once again, that's just volume, no push pull pots or anything like that. Just straight up bridge control. But this one controls your middle pickup. So normally you can just blend it in however you want, but say you only want the middle pickup, that's what you pull that up for. Everything else gets cut out of the circuit. It's just your humbucker. So this kind of, encapsulates like three different bass guitars at the same time. I guess you could even say more because of the active frequencies, but I could see as a bass player that likes to tinker and get a very particular sound, how this would be an invaluable tool to add to your collection and arsenal. Well, here's what these things look like underneath. Just uh, a whole mess of wires. They've got so much stuff piled in here. They actually had to enlarge the route just a little bit. Let me tell you, I'm having a hard time getting things back in here. If you want to know the real reason why this is a regular pot and they didn't throw something else on here is because they had to use that space in order to fit the preamp. But what kind of surprised me about this, despite being painted over and everything, they still took the time to give it an ash body. I was fully expecting an alder body or a basswood, something like that, but they went full out for ash on this. And I think that's a really nice spec, even though unfortunately you can't see the wood grain anywhere. And they really spec this thing out on the bridge as well. This is one of the Fender's high mass bridges. That just secures to the top of these five screws and that just grounds it off. As far as our pickup readings, our neck reads about 6.88. Our bridge position reads exactly the same, 6.88. And our humbucker here, that makes sense, 11-ish. But moving on from the ash body, we get a maple neck with a rosewood fretboard. And I just wanna take a minute to say, this rosewood fretboard feels ridiculously smooth, almost like there's a light satin lacquer over top of it. There's not, it's just that's how smooth it is. Now, as far as QC, I did see one thing. Either the wood chipped in this area and they filled it in with the same stuff that they use around the inlays, or that die just sank out and kind of a mark the fretboard. It doesn't bother me too much. I kind of like the black outline that most of these things have. It helps the inlays stand out and gives them a little bit of color. But as far as our specs, it's about 1.52 inches at the nut, and that increases to 2.21 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0 0.97, and that increases to 1.02 by the 12th. The spec sheet calls this a 1975 U-shaped neck. Is this how all 70s jazz basses are? Because if that's so, I think I found my new favorite neck profile on a bass. This is super comfortable, especially coming from a guitar player's standpoint. But we have vintage tall frets, and there are 20 of them. Moving on to the headstock, we get the 70s style tuners and the 70s style logo with the disc string tree. I really like the look of this headstock. Surf green, it might not be my favorite color in the world, but everything is just so jiving about this bass. Gino's happy about it, I'm happy about it. Real talk though, I think this one looks even cooler. Check out our truss rod. He even had them reissue the bullet style truss rod. And the nut material is bone. Pretty much the only high-end spec that this thing did not get. 
is a nitro finish. But then again, in the 70s, I, I, I don't know if they were doing that. Just when you thought this base couldn't get any cooler, they even give you one of these bad boys. The only downfall is you have to install it yourself. They don't even drill you the holes. They do leave the holes open in the pick guard for some strange reason, but they don't pre-drill them. Luckily, that's easy enough to do yourself. If you install it and change your mind, this is what it looks like. You just leave the screws in there. I think it, they should have just shipped it from the factory like that and allowed you to install it. But no, they just give you the screws. And something else I wanted to mention, this cover got bent. So when I was installing it, I put one screw in and I was like, oh, this isn't lining up. It, this is really malleable. You just have to bend it into the correct shape so it does fit. So I think for the playing demo, I'll leave this off, but I'll put it back on later. But moving on to the back here, nothing too crazy. We get the F-stamped neck plate for bolt-on neck. Typical comfort carve back here. And this is where you have to put the 9-volt battery in if you want to operate it as an active. What's nice is if you're in the middle of your gig and your 9-volt battery dies, you don't have anything to replace it, you can at least switch it into passive mode and not have to worry about that. Your output jack is on the side, strap button on the bottom, and on the top horn here. I had somebody request to bring back the contour gauge. This is at, at the first fret, and this is up by the 12th. You can see it's a really big U-shaped neck. It's nice and full feeling, but it does get a little bit wider up there towards the 12th. But the lacquer's nice and tinted. It feels great. It's like a semi-gloss satin finish. It's one of the better ones. And here you can see his signature. And this was a 2020 made in Japan. So it's limited edition, but not limited production. And we've got the 70s style Fender logo tuners. All said and done, this is actually a really chunky base. I'm surprised it says 10 pounds, but I knew it was pretty heavy. But let's go ahead and plug this thing in and I'll try to run you through some of these tones. Not as good as Gino can, but you know, just in a basic manner. I don't have a proper bass amp, so I'm running this directly into my audio interface. And within Logic Pro, running it through the silver dollar setting. Lots of stuff to go over today. We're gonna start it off with passive mode. That is when you have this pulled up, I found. And we'll start off with the neck position. Just the bridge. Now just the humbucker. And then of course you can also blend all of them together. So we'll start with the neck, just kind of noodle around here. Now we've got just the neck and bridge. And then remember, you can get straight to your humbucker no matter what these controls are just by pulling that up. we can go active. So here it is, just the middle. Neck pickup.
If you need a base that literally does everything as far as I'm concerned, check one of these things out. I was really impressed with the quality of this thing. Most bases I review on the channel, they're kind of cheap bases, you know, a couple hundred bucks. So it's kind of nice to have something really high end. This is the most comfortable base I've ever played, but it's also the first one with this U neck shape. And it just, it fits my hand like a glove, as cliched as that sounds. I honestly prefer running it as passive, but if you like the active stuff, you've got all that in here too. It's pretty heavy though, so keep that in mind. But the fretboard just feels so ridiculously smooth, especially with the satin neck yet on this one, where it's just like that in-between semi-wet glossy, so it still feels high-end, but still you can slide around on it. It's great. So if you're looking for a bass that's super versatile and you want to support a guy that just absolutely loves playing bass and doing what he does, I would highly suggest importing one of your own. This is a Japan exclusive, but I, I think Fender could release this in America and people would dig this stuff. So thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.